before I begin, um, I'd like to introduce a couple very important groups of people to the Hall of Fame. First, I'd like to introduce the incoming class, those members who are with us tonight, the class of 2021. Um, your support in being here to support the anniversary reunion class is just terrific, and we appreciate, we really appreciate that. If you would just give a wave, Gary Kamak, I saw of Union Center is a 2021 inductee. Dr. Dave Kapaska of Sioux Falls. Dave, if you'd give a wave. Dan Kirby of Sioux Falls. In my window, you're right by Dave Kapaska. Steve Lindquist, another inductee, is with us tonight. And Deb Teason, representing her late husband, Craig Teason. Welcome to all of you, and thank you for your support in being here tonight. We also have some of our very hardworking South Dakota Hall of Fame board members. Our vice chair, John Porter, is here. Our treasurer, Dr. Lauren Cheddar. Hi, Lauren. Our past board chair, Michelle Lavalley of Sioux Falls. And our board member and our auction chair, Jerry Lickness. Thank you for being here tonight. It is uh, the time and talents of all of these people who make the hall what it is. And the staff, the very hardworking staff members of the Hall of Fame are with us tonight too. Our CEO, Greta Chapman. We've heard from Greta tonight. Our program coordinator, Lori Platzer. Lori, give us a wave. And Kelsey Stein, who helps us with all of our marketing and communication. We're so appreciative for all of you and thank you for being here tonight. So as we begin the program, if any of you have questions or comments, please use the chat function. Somebody is helping me watch out for those. We'll either address your comments or questions at the time or at the very end. We'll have a little optional time for you to stay on and chat if you would like. So without further ado, let's begin the anniversary reunion meetup. And if all of you except Bill Russell would turn off your cameras, and I'm starting with Bill because he is our most recent inductee of five years ago, class of 2016. And for those of you who don't know him, in 1980, Bill Russell made his off-Broadway writing de debut with Fortune. The show ran for 241 performances and was subsequently performed all around the country. After huge success off-Broadway, Bill made his Broadway debut with Sideshow. He received a Tony nomination for best book and shared one for best score. The show also received a nomination for best musical. The original cast recording was released by Sony Classics and a Broadway revival in 2014 was directed by Oscar winning screenwriter and director Bill Condon. It received huge critical acclaim and five drama desk nominations, including best musical re revival. Bill, so glad you could be with us tonight. And what's your life been since you were inducted, been like since you were inducted five years ago? Well, a lot of, uh, a lot of work. I directed uh, three shows at the Black Hills Playhouse, which is very near to my heart. And two of them I I'm one of the authors of. Uh, but then in, oh, my light just fell off. Then in um, 2000, 19, my whole profession shut down all over the world. <laughs> and uh, oddly enough, though, as as difficult as little as was happening, we did um, a streamed version of one of my shows, an AIDS piece that I wrote in, started writing in 1987, and we did it as a benefit uh, for Broadway Cares. This was just exactly a year ago, and we had 51 stars of uh, television, theater, and movies, including Nathan Lane, Cynthia Nixon, Fran Drescher, Richard Chamberlain, J.K. Simmons. Uh, it was, and we did it all on Zoom. Everybody recorded themselves, but we rehearsed it entirely on Zoom. So that was incredible. And then um, I had a show that opened both in New York and London in 2018 called Unexpected Joy. And it was picked up for publication and licensing but the company that picked it up was then acquired by a huge conglomerate and that took a while to sort out but once it did and was finally published and licensed the pandemic hit so nothing happened with that for a while but this last weekend 
Um, I was flown to Austin to see uh, a production there and then uh, came back and saw one that opened the same day in New Jersey across the river from where I live. So it feels like, you know, theater's coming back, uh, the world's coming back, and uh, my career is coming back. <laughs> Thank <Yay>. you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what you have just demonstrated tonight? Not only during COVID must the show go on, and you found ways to do that during Zoom, but again right. tonight, when your light, fall, your light fell off, you didn't miss a beat. I'm so impressed. <laughs> <laughs> the show must go on. Well, thank you for being with us. Congratulations and stay with us as we move to the next class. Sure. Thank you. So now we'll move to the class of 2011. 10 years ago, the first member is Don Barnett. Uh, Don Barnett grew up in what we in Rapid City know as the Gap. It's that area between Rapid City's downtown and its west side where the city meets the Black Hills. It was out of those hills on a night in June, June 9th, 1972, that a cataclysmic flood roared out of those hills that ultimately left 238 Rapid Cityans dead. It destroyed 720 homes, severely damaged another 1,400, and ruined 200 commercial structures along Rapid Creek. Uh, at just 29, Don Barnett was then mayor of Rapid City and the youngest mayor in the city's history, and he faced an immediate and immense test of his executive leadership as he guided Rapid City through those first days and then months and years of recovery. We're coming up now on the 50th anniversary of that horrible event, and Don's leadership is demonstrated when you drive through Rapid City. He literally helped change the face of this city for the better. Uh, Don Barnett also saw several through began several construction projects, including Rapid City's Civic Center, and he helped uh, bridge a divide uh, in the community during the American Indian Movement in nineteen in the nineteen seventies in Rapid City. Since your induction ten years ago, what's your life been like? Well, it's it's been uh, you know it was complicated by two factors when I was inducted. I have to explain, I've been to the dead dentist all day and I have a wad of painkiller in my cheek, but I'll talk slow, okay? okay. So I was in the middle of grief about my, my wife dying. We had 32, 38 years of marriage. And then also about a, uh, during the period of time when my daughters nominated me. I, I developed some heart problems. And so it was a, an adventure to uh, go through the Hall of Fame thing in 2011, but it was one of the most noble uh, honors of my life. And is everybody able to understand me? You're just okay? fine, yep. But, but he, anyway, we made it through the, the first part of it, but shortly before the banquet, I was in my room and putting on my suitcase and wham bone, I felt the pain across my chest. I stepped out in the hall and then there was a dear friend of mine. He'd been a friend 60 years. He said, Barney, what's wrong? And I said, you better give me a doctor, Jim. He said, can you make it to the lobby? And I said, yes. And Jim just took off like a rabbit and found a doctor and met me in the lobby. And mm -hmm. they put all sorts of testing on me. But I hung around. I said, look, I've been working on this speech all summer. I'm going to give it. And so they changed the program. My fellow inductees were somewhat embarrassed by all this, but they have remained great friends. And I would sure like to have Donus call me if, if he would. Uh, we're going to do a little business. But the long and short of it is, I it, it took about a year, and they found out that I had severe blockages in my heart. They put in three stints. And I have lived happily ever after. No health problems since there, since then. But uh, the idea, I did have a ma major event this summer. But I'll get in into that later. But I, I have finished that book now about the definitive history of the disasters in Rapid City. The, the book is selling very well. We had some seminars in Rapid City over the past weekend. We had about 250 people attend. And we sold about that many books, so I'm I'm on a I'm on a real run here with the book selling and doing 
promotional events all over South, South Dakota now and, and during the winter. And uh, I will certainly be at the event in May. I don't want to hog the program here. I'm a little self-conscious of this. Well, Don, we're so glad you could be with us. And please stay for the rest of the program because we are talking with some of your other class members. You can go ahead and, and turn off your camera. All right. Next up is Watson Parker, who's represented by his son, Jim, tonight. Jim, I know I saw you earlier. Go ahead and turn on your camera. Welcome. Let me, let me tell the group a little bit about your dad. Dr. Watson Parker has contributed to the culture and history of the American West, especially in the Black Hills of South Dakota. After earning his BA, he went on to earn his master's and his PhD in Western American history and Plains Indian cultural anthropology. We all owe a particular debt of gratitude to Watson and his co-author Hugh Lambert for their vision in cataloging, photographing, describing and preserving the stories of many of the ghost towns in the Black Hills in their book, Black Hills Ghost Towns. I can tell you from firsthand knowledge, it is still used in all of the community ed classes for those of us interested in Black Hills history. Watson published about 40 scholarly articles on the Black Hills and Western topics and another 40 scholarly book reviews. Uh, Jim, I just so appreciated reading your dad's book and, and reflecting on how much of that history would have been lost without his efforts. And I wonder if there are things that you could share with us about him since his induction into the Hall of Fame. Well, thank you, Marcy. <clears throat> Some kind words there. You made him sound very learned and, and uh, um, prolific as far as the things he wrote. But truth be told, he, he just liked visiting all these old towns in the mines and telling other people about them. You know, he, he always used to say, well, if it ain't true, it ought to be. Um, and, and uh, um, you know, if you collar him on the front porch of our place out in Palmer Gulch, he would, uh, he would talk your ear off and pretty much tell you anything you needed to know. Um, and he's been gone um, close to 10 years now. We all miss him. Uh, and I try sort of, half-heartedly to carry on his legacy. I've been working with a couple of uh, South Dakota authors, I, working with Linda Hasselstrom and, mm -hmm. and Ann Stanton, whom some of you folks may know, uh, to get some, uh, some of their work published. And uh, I've unearthed a whole bunch of dad's lecture slides and uh, um, slides and audio that uh, another guy from Sioux Falls recorded over the years at uh, the West River Conference and the Madison um, Conference, and very, very slowly getting these things put together so as to preserve dad's legacy and make it available more generally to people as, as we all get older. Um, it's a mighty task, I have to say. Um, but uh, part of, part of the, the legacy that he left, you know, you go on Facebook and there are a number of uh, abandoned uh, and historical sites and people are always going out to uh, various towns. They go to, uh, to to scenic and to Ardmore and Cottonwood and they shoot pictures and going, yep, yep, there's Cottonwood. Yep. Because when we were kids, we would we would go and uh, visit these places. As a matter of fact, I worked with Hugh Lambert. He gave me my first job in advertising. And uh, dad and Hugh both passed within a couple months of each other, um, which was it was a tough year. But mom is still mom still lives in Rapid City, and we still have our place, my brother and sister and I, uh, and we spend quite a bit of time in Palmer Gulch, and we're always happy, to, you know, to let people, you know, take people to see some of the places that are left, which you know there aren't many. A lot of that stuff is just burned down or fallen down or been torn down, um, but you know we carry on, so we're happy to be here. Well, and thank you for carrying on both his work and his legacy by being here tonight. We appreciate it. Thanks, Jim. Sure. Thank you, Marcy. Yeah. You're welcome. Uh, our next inductee is Lynn Sepla. Lynn, am I saying your last name correctly? That's better than most people do. Yes, that, that's, that's perfect. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad. I didn't have an opportunity to ask you ahead of time. Well, let me, let me give your brief bio for the rest of the group. Uh, Lynn Sepla, a world-leading designer of state-of-the-art optics for pure and applied science, 
led the optical design of billion dollar projects at California's Lawrence Livermore Laboratory for over 35 years before his retirement. They include the 192 laser beam national ignition facility, which produced the first ever in laboratory thermonuclear ignition. I have to say that slowly <laughs> to get it out correctly. The Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, which maps dark matter and unravels dark, dark energy's nature. And a photon collider, a linear accelerator that advances studies in precision physics. He also worked on a team designing LIFE, L-I-F-E, LIFE, a laser-powered fusion energy plant that hopefully will be delivering power to the national grid in our lifetime. And I have to ask you, Lynn, when I read your bio at the time of your induction 10 years ago, when we talked about that LIFE project, it was within 25 years, hopefully, we'd be delivering. Is it still on that timetable? Is it now 15 years? Unfortunately, LIFE is dead. But anyway, oh, no. it, it's a, it was something that way too far in the future. So um, the uh, laser fusion has been very successful in, in doing it, but it's uh, it, something will always be a, a long ways away, but we're making progress. Well, what else would you add to your story? Well, I retired in 2013 uh, after a 37 year career. LSST, the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, is now the Vera C. Rubin Observatory. And it's, I'm anxi anxiously looking at its beginning to collect light in 2022, just uh, less than a year away. So I'm active on um, oh, four or five boards, uh, UC Merced Foundation, uh, the local community foundation, and then three or four groups are perform at the Banquet Theater, um, the local symphony, and a speaker series, and a chamber music series. And I try to keep uh, up to my wife, who uh, has been publishing the independent newspaper since 1963, and is involved in numerous um, activities downtown in, in the city of Livermore. So that's my, I keep that, that keeps me busy. It sounds like it. Well, thank you for being with us tonight. We're so glad to see you again. So, Good to be you. here. Right. I'm going to move now to the class of 2006, 15 years ago. And one of its inductees is with us tonight, Stanford Adelstein. Stan, if you would go ahead and turn on your camera while I tell a little bit about you. Uh, Stan Adelstein is well known in Western South Dakota and across the entire state as a guy who makes things happen. Of the many, in, many awards and honors he has received, perhaps two sum up his character best. In 2004, Adelstein was named South Dakota Philanthropist of the Year, and in 1980, 1991, he received the Rapid City Chamber of Commerce's prestigious George Award, named for uh, Let George Do It. He's the guy who does it. Just a few of the projects that Stan has been integrally involved with include organizing the first, first public fundraising campaign for the Black Hills Playhouse. He also organized plans for a new library, beautiful new library building in Rapid City. He worked with Art Dahl and Bob Gay, developing plans for the Dahl Fine Arts Center, now a showplace in Rapid City, and worked uh, to help establish the Rapid City Civic Center. Stan has also served in the South Dakota legislature. He is an author and a well-known philanthropist across the state. Uh, Stan, you were inducted 15 years ago, but you've been engaged in many things since. Well, how would you update your uh, life story at this point? So what has happened in the last 15 years? I served in the legislature. I won 11 elections uh, and lost one. I ran in 11 primaries and generals. I lost one, um, which was a very vicious anti-Semitic attack on me. And uh, it turned out that um, I endorsed the, uh, my, opponent, my Democratic opponent who was elected and I came back to get that seat. Uh, I've had my first great-grandchild born uh, about four weeks ago. 
in Washington, D.C. That's sort of a, of a major place. And she, in, on, on my granddaughter's side, uh, she had four grandparents, as everyone always has, but she chose to be born on my birthday. The That's other funny. three great grandparents, none of whom are still living, were survivors of the Holocaust. And she was born on my birthday in Berlin, Germany, where her father, a West Point graduate, was the first anti-terrorist unit, unit commander in the United States. <laughs> A lot of things have happened since then, but I, I can't um, recite them all. It seems that life still goes on with a lot of opportunity. And the nice thing is, not nice, the most astounding thing is how well I'm treated by my neighbors and the rest of the, the people that we know so well uh, all over the state. I'm so grateful to be free, and I'm so grateful to, to have had the opportunity to, to participate. I just, oh, I guess the other thing would might count, I just passed my 90th birthday. And did a wonderful thing in Rapid City where your donation to 90 people paid for them in, to incentivize them to get a COVID shot. So continuing your philanthropy and charity. Yes. So, well, we're, we're so glad to have you in the Hall of Fame and so glad to have you with us tonight to represent the class of 15 years ago. Thank you, Stan. And now I'll move to, to the class of 1996. 25 years ago and representing by audio tonight is Renee Flood. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Renee and then I'll ask you if you have any comments, Renee. Renee Sansom Flood is an award-winning author, historian, educator, and speaker whose sixth book of historical nonfiction, Lost Bird of Wounded Knee, was an entry considered for the Pulitzer Prize in 1995. When Flood first saw an 1891 photograph of L.W. Colby holding his adopted daughter, Lost Bird, she saw the look in Colby's eyes and she picked up that challenge. The very next day, she launched a 15 year journey to find out what happened to Lost Bird. She received a grant from the Burlington Northern Foundation to complete her manuscript research, which to that point had been done just in her spare time. So what began as a simple story about a Lakota girl ultimately exploded into a saga of family torment, women's suffrage and lost souls. Renee's work culminated and her research culminated as she was able to be a witness as Lost Bird's remains were reinterred next at Wounded Knee next to her, to her family in a very emotional ceremony. Renee, congratulations on your induction 25 years ago into the Hall of Fame. Thank you for being with us tonight. And did you wish to share something to update your story? And I'll have to have you unmute. Okay, well, I'll go ahead and move on then. Renee, we're glad you're with us. So let me move on to Roscoe Dean, who was inducted in 1981, 40 years ago. And he's being represented by his granddaughter, Susan Arnott. Roscoe Elmer Dean was born in 1891 to Martha and Theodore Dean. The family homesteaded in Dakota Territory in 1883. And by the time he was 20, he had ridden across most of Western South Dakota herding cattle on the unfenced prairie. He became a leader in civic affairs and for many years was a national director of the Consumers Cooperative of America. During the time he was director of what is now known as Farmland Industries, Roscoe took an active part in establishing the co-op petroleum and fertilizer industries. Dean had a life woven of hard work, of failure and many successes, of heartache and of happiness, and it was directed always, he said, by the faith in the principles of his Christian philosophy. Susan, we're glad you could be with us tonight. 
Um, is there anything you'd like to add about your granddad? There we go. There we go. <laughs> there we go. Um, I will just be able to say that my grandfather died on December 30th, 1973. So he's been gone a long time. I'm sort of our family historian, so I'm doing everything I can to learn about him um, and, and the rest of his, his ancestry and his descendants. Uh, he, he was the, the uh, father of my, of my father, who is Dr. Roscoe Dean Jr. And um, my dad was doctor in Westington Springs for 40 plus years and uh, kind of one of the last of the country, old country doctors. And my grandfather also has uh, uh, Roscoe Dean the third who lives in Chamberlain, my brother Rocky, and his son lives in Rhode Island and is Roscoe Dean the fourth. So um, my, my grandfather, my grandmother lived for many more years after my grandfather died and she stayed on the farm. They always lived on the farm that Theodore Dean had, uh, had started and it was called Sylvan Farms, started in 1906. And grandpa lived there until he died. And then grandma lived there until she was 96 years old on that same farm. And she died in 1988, September, or uh, she died also at the end of the end of the year in 1988. Well, they yeah, have you left in, uh, well, a couple of descendants left in Westington Springs. Dr. Tom Dean is his grandson. And he just retired after a 44, 40 year, uh, um, practice, medical practice here in Westington Springs. Deep roots in South Dakota, or an early deep start roots. in deep roots. <laughs> and my husband yeah. and I come back here after a, a 30 year uh, Air Force career for my husband, and we decided to come back here. So, so we're here in Westington Springs, as is my sister, Dr. Mary Jane Bells, who retired here, and my brother, Timothy Dean, who has my dad's cattle ranch. So. Oh, fabulous. Well, thank you for being here to share that story tonight. And we're so glad as at the Hall of Fame that we are able to preserve his pioneering story in the state. Thank it's you for doing many things you do. Thank you. Thanks for being with us. Let me move now to another member of the class of 1981, Rose Wilder Lane. And Ms. Lane is represented by uh, Nancy Copel, who is a South, also herself. Nancy is a South Dakota Hall of Fame. Um, inductee. She's a past director of the South Dakota Historical Society Press and director of the Pioneer Girl Project, which is studying the works of Rose Wilder Lane and her mother, Laura Ingalls Wilder. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about Rose Wilder Lane, although I think many of us grew up knowing her story. She was an American journalist, a travel writer, a novelist, a political theorist, as well as a libert libertarian spokeswoman. Although her mother, Laura Ingalls Wilder, is now the better known writer, Laura, uh, Lane's accomplishments remain remarkable. She was an astounding student graduating at the top of her high school class, but her acad her, despite her academic su success, her parents' financial situation put college out of reach for her. After World War I, Rose Wilder Lane became a reporter for the American Red Cross and it was she who encouraged her mother to try and earn some extra money writing and was integral in the Little House in the Big Woods story being written. Uh, for her own writing, Wilder Lane was awarded the O. Henry Award. A hall at Freedom School Colorado Springs is also named in her honor. Uh, Nancy, are there other things that you would capture and tell us about the story of Rose Wilder Lane? Yeah. Oh, we'll need to have, have you unmute. Uh, everybody cancels. There you go. Am I unmuted? You're good. Okay. <laughs> um, one of the, the in the 1930s, Rose Wilder Lane wrote two best-selling novels set in Dakota Territory: "Let the Hurricane Roar" and "Free Land." And these two stories introduced national audiences to the pioneer heritage of South Dakota. Even so, Lane is better known today for her role as one of the quote, founding mothers 
of the American libertine, libertarian movement. As journalist and essayist, she wrote much about liberty and the nature of freedom during the 1930s and 1940s. For me, as director of the Pioneer Girl Project, which is study, studying the evolution of Laura Ingalls Wilder's books, beginning with her memoir, Pioneer Girl, Rose Wilder Lane's most important legacy was her role, is her role as editor and agent for her mother's autobiographical novels, beginning with Little House in the Big Woods in 1952. It was Lane's guiding hand that brought Wilder's children's book to the public. These books have resonated with readers of all ages and nationalities for more than 75 years. Lane lived a long and productive life, leaving behind a wide ranging correspondence and a body of literature that showcases, showcases her sharp wit, her brilliant editorial ability, and her strong personality. Shortly before her death in 1968, Lane toured Vietnam as a war correspondent, keeping her finger on the pulse of American life just as she had in the 1940s. Um, I would just add as a side note that Lane, uh, Lane is the star more or less of the new book from the South Dakota Historical Society Press entitled Pioneer Girl, the Revised Text, which came out in October. Good, Nancy, thank you for being here to update that story. We really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. Well, those are all of our anniversary reunion class members and what amazing and inspiring lives. Every time these kind of classes come together, uh, it reminds me of why I'm inspired to be connected with this organization to make sure these stories live forever in the state to inspire people who come behind us. Um, our goal is to use your stories, not only to preserve them, but to use them to inspire and educate the next generation. And I want to give you just a brief update on what we call our five lanes of service, kind of what we're doing with your stories. Um, Greta is going to give us a split screen here so we can show you um, a little of that work. There we go. Uh, so you're probably most familiar with the honors ceremony. You've all been through it, and some of you who are with us. And by the way, I would note we've had another class of 2021 member join us. Angela Kennecke is with us from Kello TV. Angela, glad you're here tonight. Um, the honors ceremony with which you're most familiar is the annual ceremony where we induct up to 10 people. In 2022, two classes will be inducted. The 2021 class delayed due to COVID will be uh, inducted in May, May 20th and 21st. And in 2022, that class will be elected on a regular schedule in on the second Friday and Saturday in September in Chamberlain. And we hope all of you in the anniversary classes will be able to join us. Greta's scrolling through the class of 10 that will be inducted in May. We hope you'll be able to join us to celebrate their accomplishments. Uh, our second lane of service is what we call legacy of achievements. So once elected, your story joins over 730 stories that we maintain and preserve digitally on your own legacy of achievement page. Uh, the use of this material is experiencing double digit growth since COVID has happened, interestingly. Uh, we continue to market the digital use of this material to anybody who has a computer and we continue to see the numbers climb. Uh, your story can be updated and we encourage you to update it as events change with your family. You can add links, video, photographs, and we hope you will do that routinely because we know as we've heard from all of you tonight, there are updates in your lives since you were elected into the Hall of Fame. And we will correspond with you about how to do that. And of course, if you have any questions about it, you can reach out to any of the Hall members uh, who I introduced you to earlier. Um, our third lane of service is legends and learning. We take many of the stories of inductees and we turn them into free digital programs curriculum uh, that's used uh, again free by teachers in grades K through 12. 
We work with teachers to adapt the stories into curriculum in multiple ways. Um, this year, thanks to generous donors, Legends and Learning launched a new platform of the materials this year. We actually uh, worked with several teachers to find out what we should do for the new generation of students and got some wonderful feedback and are updating the Legends and Learning program to make it even more user friendly uh, in classrooms in South Dakota. Our fourth lane of service is acts of excellence. You know, not everyone will be like you and their life work will not, uh, not uh, account for them being elected into the Hall of Fame. But what we say is nearly everyone can do at least one thing to make a positive impact in their community. And Acts of Excellence started four years ago to collect and celebrate these single difference making moments. We now have over 100 acts in our digital directory. They're available to the public. And our goal was that collecting them and putting them out there for people to read will inspire other people to do similar good works. Our next Acts of Excellence celebration is in March 2022 in Mitchell, and we hope you can join us. And finally, the Visitor and Education Center. Uh, it's our bricks and mortar location in Chamberlain. Many of you, if not all of you, have been there. Um, many of our inductees and family members visit. Uh, we hope you do. We're glad when you do. The center houses the inductee collections, and it includes several rotating exhibits designed to underscore our mission, which is to champion a culture of excellence in the state of South Dakota. So that is our program for tonight, to celebrate you as former inductees. And we will put you all back on the screen if you wanna, those of you who are still, still with us, wanna turn your cameras back on. And just wonder if any of you had any questions, observations, thoughts, suggestions you'd like to pass along. Dave Kapaska, Marsh Ed, just, uh, um, you know, not being a long-term South Dakotan, many of these stories are new to me, uh, to say the least, and uh, to be in line with, uh, with people that have accomplished the things they've accomplished is an honor personally, but also an amazing uh, statement for our state and uh, uh, culture and such. So thank you. Thank you, Dave. Michelle Lavallee here, and I just want to tell all this year's inductees what a pleasure it was to read your, to read your the applications and to read your stories. Um, it makes you proud to be a South Dakotan. You know, Susan, you said something about coming back after 30 years. I did the same thing because this state has a pull um, you never forget what a special place it is, and it is a joy to be back. Um, so glad you are back in the state. Uh, you, you know, it is a special place, and what we do at the hall is collect those stories of the people who have made it what it is today. And there's Angela joining us. Hi, Angela. Give a wave. There you go. Well, folks. Hearing no further comment, I just want to say congratulations again to all of you. Congratulations to the class of 2021. And thank you for being here to show your support of the past inductees. We thank you for being with us. And we hope to see you again. Have a great evening and wonderful holidays. Same to you. Thanks. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Thanks, Marcy.